In Paul's words to the Corinthians is a reminder to seize the moment, living by God's values, making the most of time allotted to us. In light of our short lifespan, we are to become people of both heavenly minded and earthly good. From 1 Corinthians 7, 29 through 31. I do not want, I do want to point out, friends, that time is of the essence. There is no time to waste, so don't complicate your lives unnecessarily. Keep it simple in marriage, grief, joy, whatever. Even in ordinary things, your daily routines of shopping and so on. Deal as sparingly as possible with the things the world thrusts on you. This world, as you see it, is on its way out. And Mark brings us the call of the fishermen, Andrew and Simon, James and John. After Nathaniel's skepticism last week, this call story offers a very different alternative. These disciples don't question Jesus' authority. They acknowledge it and drop everything they have to follow him. From Mark 1, 14 through 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. So lots of words in there, right? But the standout for me this time around is immediately. Where Luke often uses the phrase, in those days, to signal a change in scene, and Matthew uses the phrase, when Jesus had finished saying these things. For Mark, the key word is immediately. In fact, read out loud straight through, the whole of Mark's gospel conveys a sense of urgency in the ministry of Jesus. Mark is a no-fluff, no-frill kind of guy in his writing. There's no soft start with beautiful infancy narratives, no manger, no shepherds, no elderly prophets singing praise to God in the temple as they hold the babe, the promised one, in their arms. With Mark, the curtain opens in the middle of the story with an adult Jesus on the scene, first being baptized by John in the Jordan River, then tempted by Satan in the wilderness where he dallies for a mere two verses before moving at a clip pace to John the Baptist's arrest as a point of punctuation to establish his main point, which is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. All of that happens in just the first half of chapter 1 of Mark's gospel. Definitely a get-to-it kind of guy. For the remainder of that first chapter, Jesus engages in preaching and teaching and healing and casting out demons from dawn until the setting of the sun. And it begins with Jesus' very first words of proclamation. The time is fulfilled. He announces the time is now, or as Eugene Peterson renders it in the message translation, time's up, time to get going. It's an attention getter, right? He's not talking about time as we keep track of it in days or weeks or months or years. Jesus' time is Kairos time, heaven sent favorable, promising as moments for decision or action. And the people of Israel had been waiting for just such a moment when the heel of their current oppressor, there had been many from Egypt through Assyria and Babylon to now Rome, who would be removed from their throats, moved from the throat relative to the message of his ministry. It's also the kind of time we long for, in fact, pray for, peace now. Unity, now. Equality, now. Certainly, certainty, now. Heaven on earth, now. Right? The people of Israel trusted in the promises of God, even when everything around them contradicted and even violated the vision of justice and peace, of shalom that was at the heart of those promises. 
the prophets spoke and sang of this hope and the people of God hold on to it and long for it and watch for it then and now how could we not for God is good all the time the disciples are face to face with Jesus Cairo time and in the context within which they live drop everything to follow him without even a rousing sermon from Jesus or a dramatic miracle or better yet the sky opening up and a voice announcing that this was God's own beloved they just drop everything when he invites them immediately if something dramatic had happened in Mark's discourse about this or his story about this it might have provided some explanation for their immediate abandonment of everything they knew to follow Jesus and despite the immediacy of everything around us today, it's challenging to imagine what would actually move us enough to take that leap of, well, faith, right? Because it's easy to get caught up in the questions that crowd our decision-making. Could we? Would we do that? And if we land in that thinking space, are we missing the point? We could spend a lot of time speculating about why the disciples followed Jesus. Maybe immediately in Mark's context is less about marking time and more about describing action. Immediately is about not only a when, but a what. Not only about a place and time, but an event that in today's story changes the meaning of the lives of those who do respond. When we place our emphasis on the immediately, we're directed more towards that event and less towards how. Faith? Because we don't know how. We just know that it happened, and Jesus just happens and invades our lives in ways that we can't imagine or aren't expecting. On the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and when we let go of the how, Jesus happens in us today. Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor offers that focusing on what the disciples gave up and whether or not we could do the same puts the accent on the wrong syllable, if you will. She offers another perspective on the urgency of this story, that it's really about the power of God to walk up to a quartet of fishermen and work a right now miracle, creating faith where there was no faith and creating disciples where there were none just a moment before. Reimagined in that way, today's story can feel a little uncomfortable. Our fallback still tends to live in the questions because it's scary to step out of the questions and into immediately. Are we ready for that kind of miracle ourselves, that kind of urgency? Do we want that kind of immediate change for ourselves? In our culture of independence, our ability to make choices to determine our paths and our destinies, thank you, the notion feels daunting that we would set that aside and move towards an unknown place. We can surely do whatever needs to be done, can't we? We can fix everything, we can improve everything, we can make the future what we want it to be, can't we? At will, at a time of our choosing, the answer is, well, yes, but not from a do-it-yourself bootstrap mentality. We do these things with God. All that we need from God is within us to stay where we are or immediately or somewhere in between those things move from this to doing things. The earth-shattering miracle of Christ's presence on earth, God's love made manifest in him has already happened. God is here with us now. That we feel no urgency to live into that which we pray for is where the miracle can get lost. When we don't feel an urgency to live into that which we pray for, the miracle gets lost. Because then we're just fitting God in if and where we can, rather than following the miracle of God that is embedded in us. 
what we may have lost along the way is a full sense of that power of God to recruit people who've made terrible choices, to invade the most hapless lives and fill them with light, to sneak up on people who are thinking about lunch and not God, and smack them a little bit and with the glory of God. Whether we're ready or not, God will act. We get so ensconced in the logistics of a thing that we sometimes or perhaps too often fail to move and worse yet forget to trust that God's got this, that God's got the process. There are so many things we are already doing, already committed to, right? And sometimes we get tired and we want someone else to do it or just, oh, please, would you just tell me what to do? We want to be asked before we commit to anything and even then we'll often say no. But here's the thing. Jesus doesn't ask the fishermen to add one more task to their busy lives. He calls them into new ways of being. He doesn't give them a new list of things to do, but instead a new identity, a whole new way of life built on faith and the certainty that whatever we need, God has. And Jesus' pitch for that new job spoke to who they were and what they knew. Had his invitation been, come and follow me and I will make you travel. Hang on. There it is. They might well have had second thoughts. I would have had second thoughts. <laughs> but instead he said, instead of fishing for fish, let's fish for people. And Jesus would indeed teach them to cast a new kind of net, a net of love and compassion, a net of teaching and healing, a net of salvation over the people they met. But it never would have happened if they hadn't left the safety and certainty of their fishing nets and what they'd known to that point. Immediately they gave over to the passion already within them, that divine light within them brought to life in a way that gave them life and can and does do for us today. Because I'm suspicious that we are indeed meant to find this story of the disciples willing to follow Jesus, inspiring enough to follow in ways that are miraculous and momentous and Kairos time immediately, here and now in the world and time in which we live. Maybe we can look at it this way, the ask to come and follow immediately was made over 2,000 years ago. In the closing passage of his monumental The Quest of the Historical Jesus, Albert Schweitzer, yes, that one, reminds of the, the, us of this in words that still resonate today, I think. Schweitzer writes, he comes to us as one unknown, without a name. As of old, by the lakeside, he came to those men who knew him not. And he speaks to us the same words, follow thou me, and sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill for our time. He commands and to those, for those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship and as an ineffable mystery will learn in their own experience who he is. Or we could use Andrew King's words from a poetic kind of place. He has a meditation called Mending Their Nets. It is a day that could be like any other. The water is calm in the morning light as the gulls thread the air with their singing. The sun is warm on the backs of their necks as the fishermen bend to their mending. The blunted points of their wooden needles float in and out of the webbing create a loop, pinch with a finger and thumb, thread the needle through that loop, then around again, tighten the knot, pick up the next mesh, and on and on. Calloused hands repeating an operation handed down father to son from generation to generation. In their work, the net's hole rapidly closes. And conversation weaves in and weaves out while they're working, returning often to talk of a preacher whose words have set their hopes rising, hopes handed down like the knowledge in their hands, 
woven into the fabric of living. The wind is warm on the cheeks of his face as the preacher comes near with his message. The world is torn, there is brokenness of heart, there are wounds everywhere in creation, but the preacher has news, good news of change, that God's healing love is accessible, and he knows this good news can mend the world, can be threaded into every heart's beating. Now the preacher is calling them, calling their names, calling them to take up a new labor, calling them to see with the vision of hope people gathered in newness of community, one they will help build like a great catch of fish, abundant with fresh possibility. The water is calm in the morning light, and the gulls continue their singing. The sun is warm on the backs of their necks as the fishermen join Christ in his mending. It is a day that is not, and yet could be, like every other. From there on, Jesus is engaged in preaching and te teaching and healing, casting out demons from dawn until the setting of the sun. This is what Jesus tells us at the start of his ministry as he invites us into life with him immediately. Amen and amen.